Okay, let's get started here. Uh, so we will begin section 6.5 today. That will be the last section that we do for the semester. Uh, we will also do a final exam review tomorrow, um, Thursday. So please uh, bring questions if you have them uh, to that class on Thursday. Are there any questions before we get started here? Okay, let's uh, start section 6.5. So all of our uh, past um, material that we've covered so far has assumed that every observation was independent of each other. So observation one was independent of observation two, so it's independent of observation three, and so on. But what often, well, I should say often, but what sometimes happens is that, uh, that observations are actually dependent in some way, and specifically uh, based upon some, let's say, grouping mechanism. Here are some examples of what I mean by that. A very classic example that you would hear about maybe in a STAT 801 course, definitely you would hear about in STAT 802, involves pigs in a pen. So, for example, let's say I have a, I have a barn. And so this is kind of the outline of a barn if you're looking at it from above and remove the roof. And we have a pen here, we have a pen here, we have a pen here, and a pen here of pigs. So here's one little piggy right here. There's a the tail. Uh, there's another little piggy. And we'll just draw another one real fast. Looks like my five-year-old son's artwork. Uh, <laughs> and so, so we have three pigs in that pen. And what we might do is, let's say, apply a particular treatment, maybe um, a drug uh, to each of the pigs uh, that maybe will try to prevent a disease. And maybe, for example, each of the pigs are, are given a different kind of drug. Now, their response, which would, could be, let's say, whether or not they obtain a, uh, or come down with a disease or not, the response, the responses in that inside that pen are probably correlated in some way because they share the same pen. In the end, you don't really care about the pen itself. What you're interested in is the response of those pigs in that pen. And you have to take somehow take into account that, that correlation, that dependence between you know, uh, th these little pinkies here. Uh, so, um, many of you who, who, well, all of you have taken this, uh, or have taken the equivalent of SET 801. And you've heard, at least when I teach SET 801, I talk about a randomized complete block design. That's the most complicated experimental design I, I, I talk about in that class. And basically, in this kind of a situation, you could think of the pen as the block. That block is trying to account for that dependence between the individual little piggies. So that's one place where this dependence occurs um, of, of your observations. Uh, another kind of setting is, let's say you collect data over time in, a, in what's often referred to as a longitudinal data setting, where perhaps, let's say, uh, you have, let's say, person number one, and uh, you give the person number one a drug. Uh, and then right, be, right before you give them a drug, maybe you measure their heart rate. And then at one hour after they're given the drug, you measure their heart rate again. And maybe two hours, you measure their heart rate again. That kind of data is called longitudinal in nature. And uh, you would expect for that particular person, their heart rate, let's say at time zero, is going to be somewhat, it's going to affect the, the heart rate at time one. It's going to affect the heart rate at time two. So those three observations that you would get there are actually dependent, not independent. And in a full longitudinal like study, you would not just have one person doing that. You would have maybe, let's say, uh, N people, um, you know, uh, administer the drug and you collect the data over time for them. Uh, one from my dissertation involves choose all that apply data. So, you know, all of you have probably been given a survey at some point time point where um, there's a survey question that asks, choose all responses that apply. 
So maybe you have, let's say, four different choices to choose from. You could choose none of them, you could choose one of them, you could choose two of them, and so on. Well, the proper way to think of that data is not necessarily as data rising in from four categories, but rather four separate binary uh, uh, responses. So do you choose item one, yes or no? Do you choose item two, yes or no? All the way down to item four. So what you have there is uh, what are often referred to as correlated binary responses. They are not independent. We need to take into account the dependence that arises with them. Like I said, my dissertation was on that uh, subject. I don't do research in that area anymore, though. Um, or generally speaking, uh, what about the place kicking data? I don't know if any of you have caught on to this, but of the, you know, we have 1,425 observations going back to the data set uh, version in uh, chapter two. Well, a place kicker might actually contribute about 30 or 40, or might do 30 or 40 place kicks during a season. And so because of that, you, you may think that there's some kind of dependence amongst you know, what place kicker did the first, what, what, the place, what a particular place kicker did during their first attempt of the season, with their second attempt, with their third attempt, and so on. So there, there's that possible dependence that occurs there, and you might want to be able to account for it. So far we haven't talked about it. We will talk about it in this particular section. And, and in the end, we'll see that uh, there really wasn't um, sufficient evidence to, to indicate that we needed to account for it. So what we basically have here, another way to put it, is that we have data that's often observed in clusters or data that's observed repeatedly on, let's say, the same sampling unit. We typically will want to take uh, that kind of information into account. Um, if we don't, what can happen, and, is, and if there is definitely dependence between your observations, if we don't, often your inferences that you make are liberal. We talked about liberal confidence intervals before, meaning that even if you state 95% confidence, you might actually have 80% confidence. In, in the context of hypothesis testing, what, what, would, be, what, what would liberal mean? We're, you know, we're, well, we're rejecting when we shouldn't, essentially. Uh, meaning that, you know, if I state that I have a, a type 1 error rate of 5%, in fact, if you, if, if, if you have a liberal test, maybe it's 15% instead, or even higher. So that's why, you know, this, this is important to, to, uh, to look at. And in this section, we are going to learn one way to take in, into account this dependence. Also, I should mention that um, in this section two, we're going to talk about um, uh, something that we mentioned um, for um, uh, over dispersion. Remember, we talked about over dispersion. That one potential solution to that problem is to use what are called generalized linear mixed models. That's what that's what we're going to talk about in this section. That's a way to handle the dependence that I had just uh, mentioned. So let's talk about this, what a generalized linear mixed model is. And in order to do that, we need to talk about what random effects are. Uh, again, the prerequisite for this course is STED 801. And the one place where you typically see uh, random effects is in the context of a, of a randomized complete block design. And then, then that's it. Uh, your professor might not even mention that you, know, you had a random effect someplace in, in a particular model. If you've taken STED 802, and definitely if it's taken a stat 971, you know what random effects are. So uh, this will be review for some of you, and others of you, it will be a little bit more new. Um, what I'm going to do is explain what random effects are and also what things called fixed effects. Fixed effects are basically, um, if you think about all the models that we've been looking at so far, fixed effects are the, the terms, the stuff that was on the right-hand side of the equal sign. All that stuff has been fixed effects so far in this class. Um, so we're going to introduce things called random effects shortly. And when you have both random and fixed effects in the same model, they're called mixed models. 
Um, now, to help explain this, let's look back at this longitudinal data uh, example that I mentioned before. You know, let's say we have time point one, time point two, time point T that we're collecting heart rate information uh, on individuals for. And I, before, when I was going through my lecture notes before class, I thought, oh, I'm going to go a little bit out of order because I think, I hope, um, it, I think, and I hope uh, it will be more, uh, it will be a better explanation. So this is what's called. This is one example of what's called a generalized linear mixed model, GLMM. We talked about generalized linear models in chapter 2, starting in chapter 2. Notice the key addition there is an extra M. That's for the mixed part. Now, let's say that Y sub IK represents the heart rate of individual I at time K. So, for example, Y11 would be the heart rate at time 1 for individual 1. Y12 is the heart rate of individual 1 at time 2. We'll go all the way to time 2. Then individual number 2. We could have heart rate at time 1, heart rate at time 2, heart rate at time t. And, you know, you can keep on going depending upon whatever your sample size is. Now, what you would expect is that these Y's that I'm highlighting in blue are correlated in some way. They're dependent. You probably expect them to be positively dependent. The ones in yellow are likely to be positively dependent because it's the same individual that's contributing those responses. Similar to what we saw in chapter 4, we're going to be interested in modeling the mean response. So the expected value of y sub i k is mu sub i k. So the mean response for individual i at time k. And since this is a heart rate, let's say number of beats per minute, you know, it's a count. So I'm going to use a, what looks like a, a Poisson regression model. I'm going to use a log length function log of mu sub i k. And then similar to what we saw in chapter 4, I have a beta 0, so beta 1 times an x of i. Where beta 0 is a parameter, like our intercept parameter that we want to estimate. Beta 1 is going to be a slope parameter that we will want to estimate. This x of i, just to put it in the context of a particular example, let's suppose x of i is simply binary. It represents whether or not a person, let's say, received a new drug or maybe a placebo. Okay, so those are the two possibilities, the one or a zero. Now, this is often referred to then as the, the fixed effect portion of the model. Okay. Now, to help take into account this dependence between responses for a particular individual, here's the new portion of the model. This is going to be the random effect. It's a random effect because we are going to assume that this B here comes from a normal distribution. It actually is a random variable. So let me page down a little bit here. So this B sub 0i, so for every individual, you're going to have your own B0, and basically it's going to be a realization from a normal distribution, we mean an observed value from a normal distribution that has a mean of 0, so on average these Bs are going to be 0, and a common variance, which I called sigma squared, and I put a little B0 there because it, you know, corresponds to that right there, just for labeling purposes. Because we could have more than one random effect in the model, as we'll see later. So the big difference here from what we had in, in earlier chapters is now we have this, this random effect in our model. Overall, 
notice if I have, let's say, n individuals, I'm going to have n realizations of this random effect. Altogether, those n random effects there correspond to what we call a random factor, a random effect factor, because it's the number that we have is finite. And you know we've seen you know the factors before for a categorical explanatory variable. That's where the name comes from. So essentially, what we're doing is it, in, in this kind of a model structure. What we're saying is this: that the responses for for each individual, or the responses within an individual, I should say, are correlated. And to take into account that dependence. We're going to have this, this realization from a normal distribution that's going to be shared by essentially uh, each of the watts, you could say. Um, let me put it a different way. So I think that this way would be better. You know, maybe my heart rate is typically higher than most people. Okay, so maybe my B0i might be, you know, uh, greater than zero. And the way that 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 this is going to affect then my, my mean response at times one, two, three is essentially constant. Because I'm already starting off, you can say, at a higher point. Now somebody else, maybe their heart rate is typically lower than most people on average. And so their B0 will be negative. And, um, and you know, when you look at then their mean response at each of the time points, you're essentially starting at a lower point. And so the way that you take into account this dependence is by each of the observations for an individual sharing the same B0 realization. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes? Essentially, I have a random interceptor. Not yet. <laughs> we'll, we'll get to that. So, but the key thing again is to, to understand how we take into account the dependence for observations for a particular individual. Is that they are each sharing, or or each observation sharing essentially this common term. And what makes this different from what we've done before is that X before did not have a distribution. Still doesn't have a distribution. You know, it doesn't have a we're not saying that x comes from a normal distribution. We're not saying that at all. We're saying it's just it's a fixed constant. The b's, though, come from a, a normal distribution. And so what that then says then is that, you know, let's say if I want to use this model outside of just my, my data set, of, um, you know, people that are in my sample itself. Well, you know, then that, um, you know, again says, okay, there's somebody else has a new b0 out there. Um, so what else did I want to say? Let me make sure I talk about everything here. So you can say the average individual has a B0 equal to 0. Uh, this right here, this is a parameter. The sigma square, we want to estimate. So this model has three parameters to it, beta 0, beta 1, and now the sigma squared sub B0. So to help emphasize then this, this model structure, what I did was I actually wrote out for individual one how uh, essentially we're saying that this, this mean response is coming, coming about for time point one, time point two, time point down to t. And again, the key is to realize these guys don't change. For person two, again, Look at that. Those don't change either. Now what makes this even more interesting, I think, is that so we're saying that this B0 you know, is a realization, meaning observed value from a normal distribution. But it's actually an unobserved, uh, unobservable uh, value. You know, do I know my B0? No, I don't. I know somebody else's B0? No, I don't. But we know that this is going to 
you know, account, uh, we know that this grouping mechanism, the fact that an individual uh, contributes multiple responses, is going to uh, lead to some, some dependence amongst your data. And we can take that into account by putting a random effect in our model. Also, do note that we have independence. So each of the Bs, you know, uh, you know, my B is independent from somebody else's B for the, how the realization comes about. So here are some, some other possible models that one could have. I basically showed you just about the simplest kind of generalized linear mixed model that you could have. Here are some other possibilities. Notice the blue that's up there. So now in this in this first model here, x sub i k versus just x sub i that I had before. So what this says is that if I'm giving someone a new drug or a placebo, this is essentially saying that this x can change at each time point. Maybe instead of just doing the new drug at, at the beginning of the process, maybe at time one, time two, time three, I can either give them a drug or a placebo. And so now my X's can change. Then getting back to what we were uh, mentioning a few minutes ago, now suppose I also add another random effect to my model. Here what this allows me is, is allows for the slope to uh, essentially be a random effect. Now, this B1i also has a normal distribution to it, could. Now, you could actually use some other distribution, uh, but typically normal distributions are used because they're easier, or I think it's easiest to start off with normal distributions, how about if I put it that way. Notice this also has another uh, sigma squared there. We need to estimate that. So now I have a fourth parameter to worry about. And Suppose then that this, this, these Bs are independent of the other Bs that we had before. But those Bs do not have to be independent. They could actually be dependent. And when they're dependent, then that means that what you could do is assume that these Bs have a joint normal distribution. If you've ever heard of a bivariate normal distribution before, if you haven't, don't worry about it. And that allows me to specify a particular correlation between the Bs. And we can even generalize it even more. Maybe we have an additional random effect here that allows for dependence over time. So notice the subscripts there. C0K now. You know, maybe, for example, you would expect a, uh, a certain kind of dependence that occurs between 1 and 2, and that same kind of dependence should occur between 2 and 3 same dependence between 3 and 4. This is just some possible models. And the purpose of this section 6.5 is just to give you the, an introduction to what generalized linear mixed models are. If you want a lot bigger explanation and use it a lot more, take step 971. Um, do note, though, that does require a, a lot higher mathematical background than what the um, uh, prerequisite is for this course. So let's take a look at then at the place kicking data set. So in my file place kick with names that CSV that you can download from my book's website, um, I have exactly the same data set as you saw in chapter two, but I've added kicker. So the first two place kicks in that data set were attempted by someone by the name of Barr. The third place kick was Stover. The fourth place kick was Barr. And so what I'd like to be able to do now is you know, write a model out that takes into account the possible dependence between, let's say, observation one, two, and four. Here's just a summary in this particular data set of all the place kickers that actually uh, were in there. And so we see, let's see, three, six, 
we see about 34 different place kickers during this season. So, for example, Nick Lowry had 32 place kicks. Um, and old poor Lynn Elliott had 44 place kicks. Now, if I were to take into account then this dependence that we that could occur, here's how we could do it. Please note a little small change in the notes. So let's say I still want to model the probability of success for a place kick. And so we're going to uh, look at the logit of pi sub i k, where the i corresponds to the place kicker, the k corresponds to the kick of a particular place kicker. And let's, to make it easy, let's suppose that we just worry about distance as the, the, the only fixed effect. So again, I have my intercept term. I have my slope, beta 1, and x sub i k is going to be the distance that place kicker i had for their k place kick. B0 i is my random effect. And this will allow me to take into the account potentially the, the or allow me to take into account the potential dependence between place kicks, let's say one, two, and four for bar, for example. So bar is going to have one particular value of B0. We won't know what it is. It's an unobservable random variable. We'll actually look at how to estimate it later. And then another place kicker, Elliot, he's going to have one particular value of B0. So maybe Elliot is actually a negative. Um, so that, that could be one potential model that we could look at to model the place kicking data set. Um, now you might be wondering, well, why didn't I do this before? Why, not, why didn't I ever you know, take into account potential dependence before? Well, there are two reasons. First of all, it goes back to when I was first looking at this data set back in 1996. Statistical methods for generalized linear mixed models were not really that uh, as, as developed as they are now. So I, and I guess just to put it in perspective, maybe just I'm getting older now. I've, I look back 20 years ago, you know, we didn't have a simple preferred of proc glimmix. We didn't have that available to us. SAS didn't have any, any proc that could do these models. Obviously, R didn't exist back then. You know, we didn't ha S plus didn't have a function that did this kind of stuff. But here was another reason why. Previous research had shown that the place kickers were essentially treated by the NFL, in terms of like the teams, as interchangeable parts. And I think that's even true today. Is that uh, NFL teams, you know, rarely will ever draft a place kicker. Um, and, you know, if that place kicker wants more money, oh, okay, go, go to some other team, get some other money. We'll just get another place kicker and replace you. And if they're treated as interchangeable parts, that basically tells me then is that, you know, one place kicker is not necessarily better than another. So think in terms of that B0 then. Those B0s for those place kickers in terms of a model should be kind of close to zero. It shouldn't have much of an effect. And so that's how when I was doing this research then, how we were able to justify that, hey, I don't need to have a random effect there. And, hope, and, I, and one reason why I tell you that story is because, again, all of you will be doing research at some point, and you're going to need to be able to justify what you're doing. I have just told you one valid justification. Somebody might disagree with me, and as we will see in the end, uh, my approach when we actually look at some um, so, some um, statistical measures, my approach was is, is definitely uh, a valid way to go about doing this. Um, just so one, one further note is that in this kind of a model structure, and you'll see this more in the mathematical description of it, basically what we're saying is that, is that once we take into account that place kicker's random effect, the responses for an individual place kicker are essentially still independent. Once we take into account a particular effect by a place kicker, the corresponding responses are still independent. 
Okay, so how do we estimate one of these models? Well, as you might have guessed, based upon what I was telling you about the state of statistical software back in 1996, estimating these models is not as easy as what we have been doing so far. We still use maximum likelihood estimation, so we still write out a likelihood function, but our likelihood function is going to be messier because now, not only do we have like a y that's a random variable, we also have these b's that are random variables too. And so we need to look at ways that we can deal with that and, and, and to, to estimate these models. <coughs> okay. So some of this stuff is going to get a little bit more mathematical than maybe what we uh, normally do, but I don't really see a, a, a way around it. I'll do my best to explain it in a more intuitive manner when possible. So this random effect, again, this B is actually an unobservable random variable. So it means I can't go out and say, hey, Lynn Elliott, tell me your B. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know. It's an it's 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 unobservable random variable. Um, and um, so, but what we can do is this. How about we essentially write out a probability distribution for our y given a particular b. So in the case of that heart rate example, I can easily state the distribution of y given I know the particular value of b. That distribution of y is just given b is simply a Poisson distribution. That's it. Okay, no, no problem at all to do that part. So uh, let's see now, how did I want to write that? So we're essentially going to say that y sub i k, given a particular uh, b0, did I put b0 i or b i0? b0 i, excuse me, is going to be distributed Poisson mu i k. Okay? So you could actually write out the Poisson distribution, and you could replace that mu sub i k with what were essentially uh, with one of those models that we had shown before. So mu i k you know, is equal to e raised to the beta 0 plus beta 1 times x i plus b 0 i power, for example. So, but, but we still have this problem that b is in there. So how do, we, how do we handle that? Well, what we do is we try to find the joint probability distribution for y and b. Now, this goes back to something that you learned in your very first stat course. Um, remember, if you had two events, A and B, let's say that we were looking at the probability of A given B. Note that how this is kind of like how he's looking at the distribution of Y given this random effect B. Well, this probability of A given B, if I were to multiply it by the probability of B, what would I get? Something that goes between those two parentheses. Probability of A and B. So a joint probability between A and B. What I want to do now is find the joint probability distribution for Y and B. So what we can do, and sorry, I'm going a little bit out of order here. Suppose that this, this is a little bit more formal notation here. Suppose I represent the, the distribution of y given b by f of y given b. Okay, so all this is is a Poisson distribution in particular. It's what I drew my square around. Okay? And I wanted, I'm going to take that times the distribution for B. What's the distribution for B? Normal. Okay. Do that right there. Now the joint distribution, or if I multiply these two, two together then, 
I get the joint distribution of y and b. Okay? Now, again, do remember that this mu i k that you see here is actually that more complicated expression based upon whatever we would have set up our model to be. How many parameters do I have in that? Three. Beta zero, beta one, B, I'm sorry, beta zero, beta one, sigma squared. So I have those three parameters. What we're trying to do is get to a point where we can write out a likelihood function based upon what we just see there. And then we want to maximize it and find parameter estimates. Okay. So now this is for this is a joint distribution for let's say one person's heart rate at one particular time. Now what I'm going to do is generalize this to one particular person's heart rate at all their times. And how do you do that? Well, just simply multiply a bunch of those Poisson distributions together. That's it. So I have T different Poissons. So that in the end, this is what I'm doing right there. I get a joint distribution of all the Ys for an individual and their B. Is everyone okay with that so far? Now the reason why I can do that is again we're saying given that um, given that random effect the y's are independent. The only way we're taking into account that dependence is by that random effect. So that's for one particular person. Well of course, in a sample, I'm sorry, actually I'm getting ahead of myself. No. Oh, well. Yeah, that's fine. Sorry, I am going to go a little bit out of order here. So, so that's for one particular person. But let's say that we have observations for n particular people themselves. So then what we can do is say n, I'm sorry, the product i equal 1 to n. And now I have essentially um, uh, this, this expression written out for n different people. A joint distribution written out for n different people. The reason why I can simply multiply them together is because what happens for person 1 doesn't affect person 2, doesn't affect person 3. Now remember, what we want to do is, 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 is estimate, again, beta 0, beta 1, and sigma squared. So if we go back a little bit to just this part right here, I'm going to change things a little bit. I am going to try to get rid of that B0. Because actually, I don't really care about it, generally speaking. Uh, I don't really care about it. What, what I want to know is the effect that distance, oh, sorry, the effect that, in this case, we're dealing with the heart rate example. I want to know what's the effect that the drug has on the mean heart rate. I'm not necessarily interested in one particular person's heart rate. I want to know, well, what's the effect that this distance, that this, <laughs> this drug has on it? So I need a way to get a, get B out. And this is where we go to calculus. I'm going to integrate out my B. So it disappears. They might be looking at that and thinking, well, geez, that's an easy integral. Because I just, you know, I just deal with a normal distribution there. You know, I can factor out some constants out in front. But the problem is, is that this mu sub i k also has the b in it. So now this becomes a quite complicated integral. 
You're not going to be able to sit down by hand and do this. Well, now let's extend this idea to the end individuals. And then this is when we get our likelihood function. Our likelihood function is a function of beta 0, beta 1, sigma. Those are our three parameters. Given the information that you do observe, the y's, and we don't observe the b's, then this is my full likelihood function. This is what I want to maximize to get my maximum likelihood estimates. Any questions? Okay. I am going to skip over this part right here for now. Sorry. Yeah. The equation you have uh, I equal to my hand. Yes. I understand that I don't understand K okay. G. Yes. What's the uh, integral, integral of everything? The integral is is with with respect to B. So I have the DB zero I there. So I'm going to integrate out. I'm sorry. I am going to integrate out this guy, and there is a B inside of there too. Okay. So, you know, it's just like, you know, if I were to take the integral of negative 1, um, oh, that's not a good example, 0 to 1 of x dx, well, then that's going to be x squared over 2, 0 to 1, and you get 1 half. The key is x no longer is, is there anymore. That's why I'm going to do integration. So I'm going to get back to this part on the bottom of page 12 a little bit later. Okay, let's <clears throat> go on to here. So that, that integral that we saw in the likelihood function is a tough one to do. Again, as I said, you're not going to be able to sit down with pencil and paper and do it. And so there are three approaches, well, I guess you could say four approaches and that one could, could use here to come up with estimates of the betas and that sigma. The first one is called a penalized quasi-likelihood or pseudo-likelihood procedure. I'm not going to talk about that because that's actually the worst of the, of the four different ones. So we're just going to move on to save time. The second one, one could use what's called a, a Laplace approximation. What that basically means is this. What you can do is write out, let me, let me uh, do some erasing here first. What you can do is write out this portion of the likelihood function. It's supposed to exclude the, I didn't draw that very well. Let me try it one more time. Basically what we can do is do a numerical approximation to the stuff that I have colored in yellow so that um, it becomes a simpler form so that you can easily do an integral. Just realize, of course, that what you're doing is an approximation. And, uh, and you, we, as we know with approximations, some approximations are better than others. So that's what a Laplace approximation is. You're not responsible for the, the mathematical details behind it. We'll simply apply it to the times. Uh, number three is, is I, 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 my, my personal favorite, and I think the best overall, is using what's called Gaussian quadrature, where instead of approximating the stuff that's inside the integral, we're going to try to approximate the, the whole integral itself. And the way that's done, that's done is, let's, uh, let me uh, get Windows Journal out, is imagine, whoops, imagine you have the following setting. You know, you, you have maybe, suppose you have a normal distribution, simple normal distribution like that, okay? And you want to uh, find the area underneath that normal distribution because the area corresponds to probability. Well, what Gaussian quadrature essentially does, 
is this. You can imagine rectangles being drawn at corresponding points. And we know what the area of a rectangle is. So how about we, for those, let's see now, three, six, for those seven rectangles, let's find the area of those seven rectangles and use that as an approximation to the area to meet that curve. That's what essential Gaussian quadrature does. Now, how it chooses where to put those rectangles, well, that's where you get into more of the mathematics behind it. Okay, don't worry about that. Um, you might, you know, in an intuitive sense, you would think that this, the, the larger the number of rectangles that you have there, the better the approximation. In effect, that is true. Of course, the larger the number of rectangles that you use, the longer it's going to take uh, to do the integral, too, from a computational standpoint. So have that always in the back of your mind. Ideally, we like to be able to use a small a number of rectangles as possible. Another approach is that you can put this onto what's called a Bayesian um, uh, uh, fr uh, framework, you could say, and you can see that in section 6.6 .6 if you're interested. So overall, of those first three, I should say, Gaussian quadrature is the best. Uh, the problem is, is it's, uh, it's, it's more difficult to do, and um, in fact, the, the main function that we're going to look at in R that does it, uh, Gaussian quadrature can only be done if you only have one random effect. Um, uh, when you have more than one, uh, go to a Laplace approximation. Uh, interestingly, uh, a Laplace approximation is equivalent to Gaussian quadrature uh, if you have basically, you can say, one of those rectangles. Um, each of those rectangles in a Gaussian quadrature is called a point point of quadrature, just some terminology. So the function that we're going to be looking at in R that does this, uh, this is one of function, but this is one of the most popular ones, is GLMER. Um, this is uh, from the LME4 package, linear mixed effects. You have to download that package uh, from, from, uh, from the R website to, to use it, just like we've done at other packages in the past. Um, now, before we actually get into talking about how to use this function, I need to talk about, I'm sorry, before we actually use the function in practice, I need to talk about some of the syntax in this function because it can be a little bit weird at first. So in particular, the formula argument in the GLMER function works very similar to the formula argument for the GLM function, where you say formula equal, your response, tilde, put in what we have always called explanatory variables in the past, we can call it fixed effects now. And then to, to specify the random effect portion of the model, you have to use this syntax, a parenthesis, a corresponding fixed effect term, vertical line, and then a random effect and parentheses. So what do I mean by that? Well, our original model that we saw, model one, let me actually go back there and do a split screen. There we go. So I labeled this as model one. Hopefully you remember that from a few minutes ago. If I want to tell R to estimate this particular model, uh, to tell the fixed effects and the random effects, I need to use the following syntax. As you might expect, I have a x in there. Suppose the variable is just called x1 in my data frame. Plus, parentheses, 1, vertical line, b, in parentheses. So maybe I have some variable in my data frame called b that's acting as that grouping factor. So, you know, b will be equal to 1 for person 1 b will be equal to 2 for person 2 in my data set. Now, why do we have a 1 there? Well, notice how, you know, if, if you really wanted to, ah, you could essentially say that I have a 1 times beta 0 there. So I have an explanatory variable, let's say, that's a 1 for every single person. And if you remember, 
uh, we've looked at a few cases of this before. If I wanted to estimate a model without any explanatory variables in the past, I would have said formula equal y tilde 1. That's why then we just simply put a 1 there because basically what we're doing is ah, basically <laughs> this is difficult. Uh, basically what we're trying to do is change the intercept essentially to our model. So that's where that syntax comes from. Now let's look at another model that I label as model 2. There we go. So model 2 in the bottom frame here uh, corresponds to when I have a second random effect and it basically allows me to change the slope as well. To enter that particular model into the formula argument in R, again I have my x and then I say x1 vertical line b. What that's going to do is automatically say, okay, you want a random effect for the intercept and for the slope. Well, why? Well, again, think of it from the standpoint of what we did before. Like in chapter 2, if we said y is equal to x1, I will estimate both beta 0 and beta 1. That's why that occurs there. Same concept. Now, what this will do when you use a syntax is that, let's see, where is it? It will assume that these random effects are correlated, so they will have a bivariate normal distribution to them. If you don't want to assume correlation, then you could do it as follows. You have x1 plus, similar to what we had previously, 1 slash b, and then to specify then the separate random effect term for the, um, for the slope, you have x vertical line b, but then you have to put a zero there to say, okay, don't worry about that intercept. I don't want to intercept there. And that will force you to have two random effects that are independent of one. There is a whole bunch of other kinds of models that you can fit out there. A lot. I'm just, I'm just touching the surface here. And if you want to see more, uh, take a look at the vignette that corresponds to the LE, LME4 package. In particular, I think I have that there. It'll come up. I believe in this... In this comment, I believe I have a little table that I, inter I in in inserted. There we go. So do you see this little table here? I know it's hard to see all of it. This is a, just a, a simple screen capture. Oh, now it's gone. Well, it's easier if I just... Well, you saw it there before. It will show you a whole bunch of other kinds of models that you can do. Okay, Or just simply download the vignette. Which is, have we ever talked about vignettes? Have we talked talk about vignettes before in this class? Basically, many packages, if you go to the R website and get to the, the, the packages, basically homepage, you could say, they have what are called vignettes, which are uh, basically you know, manuals about how to use a particular um, uh, the, the functions within the package. And so uh, vignettes are, are very useful to look at. Okay, now I lost my place here. I think we are ready. Are we, re are we ready for the example? Ah, this is rough today. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we'll try this one more time. Okay, I think we're set. Okay, 
So we're going to go to the place kicking data set. Uh, this program is not on the book's website. It actually corresponds to an exercise, partially corresponds to an exercise in my book. And so the, this file then is located on my course website, not the book's website. And what I want to do is estimate this particular model associated with the place kicking data set that we saw before. And just as a starting point here, how about if I use five points of quadrature uh, to estimate this model? So I first of all have to tell R I'm going to use the LME4 package. And then I set up that I want to put the results into mod.fit5. I say, well, I guess I can actually go over here. I use the GLMER function, formula equal good tilde distance. And if we again take a look at the data set, notice I have kicker in there. Kicker is going to correspond to how I specify the random effects. So I say plus, in parentheses, since I just went for the intercept, one vertical line kicker. Then I have an, op, an argument called NACGQ. That stands for number of points of adaptive Gaussian quadrature. I want five. My data is in a data set called, or data frame called kick. And just like what we had with the GLM function, I say family equal binomial, link equal logit. Okay, so let's go ahead and estimate the model. Takes a little bit longer, not that long here. Sometimes these models can take a very long time to estimate if it's a very complicated model. And if I do summary mod.fit, we get some summary information, kind of like what we've seen in the past. Let me make this a little bit bigger here. Actually, let me just go over here and I can label it. Okay, so for example, we have AIC. We have BIC. We have the maximum possible value of the log likelihood function, at evaluated the parameter estimates, of course. We have the residual deviance as well. Then we have a table called random effects. We have kicker. Notice parentheses intercept. Tell us we only estimated that B0. So this right here, the 0 0.0763, is sigma hat squared B0. Next to it, we have something that says standard deviation. Well, that's just the square root of that. 1,425 observations, 34 kickers. Maybe remember how we saw that before. Then, fixed effects. Beta hat 0, beta hat 1. We have wall tests, just like what we've seen before. This is then how you would write out your model. Again, it should look very similar to what we had before, except now I have the B there, and I need to specify BI0 is randomly sampled from a normal distribution with mean 0 and an estimated variance of 0 0.0763. Any questions about how I write out that model? We're not estimating B. Remember, that's an unobservable random variable. It's not a parameter. I will show you later how you can estimate it. People often refer to it more as prediction instead of estimation, but it's essentially the same concept. So what's the correlation of the That corresponds to the correlation between beta hat 0 and beta hat 1. So if you were right out, you get the estimated covariance matrix out, just like what we've done before. You have that covariance in there. You can use that covariance to find a correlation. Okay. Now, unfortunately, now I have to admit that I don't necessarily like how this function is is uh, set up in terms of to try to extract information from this mod.fit five that we just got here. Um, I didn't write the package, so. I uh, I, I don't like how it was written at times. <laughs> um, it has a lot of good point, good good stuff in it, but uh, I think some things are confusing, especially for people who are beginning to learn R. Okay, so now in the past, if we wanted to see the stuff that was inside a model fit object, we would say names parentheses mod dot fit. 
We can't do that here. And the reason is because uh, this package is written using what's called S version 4. Previously, all the stuff that we've done, except for if you've on your own, you take a look at the VGAM package. Remember the VGLM function? Unless you looked at that on your own, we kind of skipped over it. Um, unless you looked at that, uh, you had uh, all the other stuff before was S version 3. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, remember R is based, is, is, is written in a way that emulates the S programming language. There have been four versions of the S language. Version 3 is the most predominantly emulated in R. Version 4 of S came out in about the year 2000, and um, it's emulated by some packages in R. This package uses S version 4, sometimes. <laughs> now, with S version 4, if you want to look at the stuff that's inside of mod.fit5, instead of using names mod.fit5, you say slot names mod.fit5. So, if I say slot names, parentheses, mod.fit5, in parentheses, we see what we're, we're used to seeing whenever we've done names before. Now, to extract stuff from this model fit object, we can't use a dollar sign anymore. Instead, we use the at symbol. So mod, so I, I'm sorry, that is actually a little bit, a bit of misprint there. Mod.fit5 at beta gives you your beta hats, for example. I mean, you can extract other information from that as well. Um, unfortunately, you cannot get the estimate for sigma squared from that. And here's, this is the best way I've seen of how to do it. So, remember how we used the summary function to summarize the information that was in there? Well, we've done this a few times before. You can actually save the results from summary into an object. And so that's what I did here. I did save.fit5. Now the save.fit5 is actually based upon S version 3. Rather than S version 4 that we had just been using. This is, this is what, what, what troubles me. <laughs> so if I want to look at the stuff that's inside a summary, or instead of save.fit, inside of save.fit5, I can use names again, and you're going to see one called var core. And if I do save.fit5 dollar sign var core, what I get out is sigma hat b0. And actually what's being done here, and sorry if this is a little bit confusing, is actually going to a, a what's called a method print function. And if you want to, if you want to be able to, to do stuff with that, that sigma hat there, like you know maybe you want to do some math with it later on, you can't just use what you see there exactly. Because notice we have groups, we have name there, in addition to something called standard deviation. So instead, notice that this is in blue. If you do as.numeric, save.fit5, dollar sign var core, then you get out sigma square, sigma hat square. If you take the square root of it, of course, then you get just um, you know, what we had above. Yes, it's complicated, but don't blame me. I didn't write it. But this is how you do it. What even bothered my co-author and I even more. And let me just emphasize that this package is very, very nice in what it can do. But what bothered my co-author and I even more is about oh, six or nine months before we finally finished the book, the package 
uh, this, a new version of this package came out. And we had already written up our section in our book corresponding to this package. The new version of the package changed some stuff. Changed the stuff enough that we had to do some major rewrites. <laughs> um, so, uh, in, in fact, when I was writing up the lecture notes corresponding to this, I even found a small typo in our book because, oh, we, we didn't check that that was changed by the new version of the package. So, uh, the, 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 I'm going to be updating the errata for the book uh, after, after our, um, um, shortly after our, our course ends, and there's a small little change. So, you know, uh, if I recommend downloading the errata, let's say, maybe in early June. Uh, to get a more updated one. Okay, so well, what happens if we use a different number of quadrature points? As I just told you, as I told you, didn't just do it, but maybe a half hour ago, uh, that you know the more points, the better, the better the approximation. Um, and while it didn't take that long for this model to fit, again, when you have more complicated models, it might take a lot longer. And so what you often will want to do is try to use the smallest number of points of quadrature possible and still get an accurate result in, in terms of good estimates of your parameters. And so what I decided to do was write some code here that looked at, well, what happens if we just use one point of quadrature? What happens if we just use two? What if we use 10? Maybe five wasn't enough. It, it is. But what if we use 10? And so what I did was, I basically wrote a for loop. We've seen for loops before, where I basically estimate the model for one point, two points, four points, five points, and ten points. You can look at the details of the code on your own, and this is what I get when I put all the estimates together in a nice little data frame. So how many points of quadrature do you think we could have got away with? Just one. Because we can see that, you know, once you get to uh, uh, you know, the difference between one point and two points is very small. Once you get from two to four, well, you know, at least in our numerical precision here, well, I guess there's a little bit with the intercept. Uh, but you can see that the, the amount of changes is very, very small. And so that's why I'd be comfortable using just one point here. So let's see now. Let's do some comments. So again, the average value, the average place kicker, let's say, would have a B equal to zero. So if we want to compare the average kicker to what we did maybe in chapter two, we would essentially have the same kind of model. So here's the model that we just estimated, and here's the model that we got from chapter two. You can see there's very little differences. How about we take a look at the AIC? So for the model in chapter two, make sure that that's clear because it might not be in the notes. In chapter two, we got an AIC when we just used distance of 779.7. .7. Now the AIC where we included the random effect, 781.09. So what have we learned about the AIC? The smaller, the better the model. Which is the better model? The model from chapter two, using this criteria. Now, later in this section, we'll actually look at hypothesis tests for sigma squared. Because if that sigma squared, if you remember, again, our model, go back up there. Let's say this sigma squared was zero. What does it say about the, the variability of the bees? It means basically every kicker is the same. And so it would make sense then if I wanted to maybe check to see if I need that random effect, I could do a hypothesis test. Is sigma squared equal to zero or not? And we'll do that later. Okay. <clears throat> so let's now talk about how we could predict random effect terms for an individual kicker. In other words, I want to predict what a person's B is. I want to know what Elliot's B is. How can we do that? And so that's going to take us back to page 12. OK. 
Okay. So this, again, gets into a little bit more of the mathematical statistics involved here, and I'll try to explain it in an intuitive manner. Um, so you might think that if I want to predict what B is, it would be helpful to know what the distribution of what B is given all my Ys. And so what I can do is I can write out for an individual B, F of B is zero, given the corresponding Ys for that, for that individual. Again, this is the longitudinal data example now. And you know what you what you learn in your very first stat class is this: if I had probability of A given B, that's the probability of A intersect B, the joint probability divided by the probability of B. And so what I can do is I can actually write out the joint probability distribution of the Ys and B. That's what we actually had done previously, divided by the marginal distribution just for the Ys. Then you can go through some, some, some various math here to do some simplifications. And you get to this point right here. So that is then the conditional distribution of B, given the Ys. So how can we use that then to predict what B should be for a particular person? Well, one place to start is maybe with an expected value. What's the mean of B0i? Well, that seems like that's a reasonable way to predict what that what person I is in terms of their effect. Okay, so we could do that. So, do the expected dot. Another way is that you could use the mode of the distribution. So, where you see the parameters, where the parameters would be, so you see where the sigma square would be. Also remember the beta zero and the beta one would exist in the mu's. Put the parameter estimates in there. Try to maximize this expression. And what that gives you then is the most probable value for B. So, you know, think of it in terms of a normal distribution, a standard normal distribution. What's the most probable area underneath that curve? Well, close to zero. And so what we're trying to do is try to find where that tip of that curve would be, essentially. That's the most probable value. And what this is, is very similar to doing the maximum likelihood estimation. The same ideas. So find the mode of the distribution. That's what R does. So now let's go back. So this is what R did. If I use the function ran EF for random effect with my mod.fit5 and pull out just the kicker, here are my estimates for the B. So this would be like B01 hat. This would be B02 hat, and so on for the place kickers. So if, if there was truly a place kicker effect, how could I find the best place kicker? Look for the largest B. Okay. Now also, there is a function R called COF for coefficients. And what that does, it extracts here are all the beta hats. And this part right here is beta hat zero plus B zero one hat beta hat 0 plus b 0 2 hat, and so on. Because now essentially this intercept is changing for every single individual. And I do some additional code there to help emphasize uh, that that actually did occur. And you know, unfortunately we are out of time, but what we're, what we're getting to is eventually we're going to show this plot right here which basically summarizes all those black lines is for each place kicker. The red line is for, let's say, the average place kicker, where b is equal to zero. And so we're going to get to a point where we can do this kind of a plot. Are there any questions? Yes? How would you interpret the random effects? The sigma squared? Oh, you mean that the variance component? Uh, did I use the term variance component with sigma squared? I apologize if I didn't. So that sigma squared 
has a particular name called, uh, it's called a variance component. And so your question is how to interpret that sigma squared. Well, it kind of gets to what I was saying before that the closer to zero, the less variability there is in, in this case, the place keepers. The, the bigger it is, the more variability. Was there another question? I was just wondering how you do pseudo likelihood instead of uh, logic here. Um, there is a, a function in the mass package that, that does it. Um, I haven't really used it that much. I, that was, uh, you know, some of the original ways that, that this was able to be worked out, but it's typically not as good. So. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. Um, 